So I'm going to talk about the world of work, the context in which HR exists and the context in which our brains and our working lives exist. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the world that I would like to see and the world that I think the world of work is heading to and what that means for how we are at work and how we feel at work. Now, if you can imagine a world where on a Friday, I mean, probably a lot of us exist in the world currently, where on a Friday we come home and we go, oh, thank God it's Friday. Absolutely classic. That's how we feel at the end of our working day. The world I want to see is the world where on a Monday morning we're bouncing up and down and we're going, yay, I'm off to work. Fantastic. I love my job. Brilliant. And most of us don't really recognise that as a world that is potential for us to live in. Now, I'm very lucky. I actually already live in that world. I love my job. I'm like SpongeBob in the morning. I'm like, I'm ready. I'm ready. And I'm there and I'm off and I'm really, really engaged. And about a third of you, if we look at the research that is done in this space by the Gallops of the world, the big organisations, particularly across the Western economies that obviously are like our own, um, about a third of you, you're with me. So you're there, you're like, yay, Monday, we love Mondays. About a third of you, you lot in the middle. You're, well, you know, work, it's all right. It's okay, pays the bills. I get to see me mates. Sometimes we get a bit of work done. Like, yeah, it's all right, it's okay. You lot, you think I'm absolutely crazy. You're like, work, work is hell. Work is hell. You are absolutely the Friday oh my God, I'm so glad that week is over. And on a Sunday, you're like, I can't believe it's Monday. Oh my God, Monday tomorrow. I, you know, I don't even want to go to bed because when I wake up, it's going to be Monday. <laughs> but that, that pattern, a third, a third and a third, is replicated in most of the research that we see around levels of engagement. And I have to tell you in the UK, we're not actually very good at it either. Um, and if you look at the G20, we're 19th. Uh, we, we do not get engagement or a working culture where engagement is possible for whatever reason and I think some of it to, to be very generalized is around our attitude of um, if you imagine the end of a project something like that in the UK we have a real tendency to say things like well do you know what that didn't go quite as badly as we were thinking it would we're very self-deprecating we don't celebrate our success and that doesn't help us in actually becoming and improving engaged cultures and engaged workplaces. And while I would hate us to ever go quite so far as taking it to the sort of very American whooping and celebrating every tiny little thing, we need to find more of a balance because there's quite clear evidence that our lack of engagement absolutely impacts our lack of productivity as a nation. So there are a whole load of things that are currently impacting the world of work. And it's because they're impacting society. They're not just impacting work specifically. One of those things is us as people. We are changing as people and as therefore people who go to work. We are far less deferential now towards authority figures and people who are in a position of authority above us than we ever used to be. You know, we don't tug that forelock anymore. We don't respect somebody as a boss simply because they are in the position of being a boss. We expect them now to earn that respect from us and earn that trust from us. And we don't trust automatically. It's the same thing. We expect that trust to be built. We don't trust doctors, we don't trust politicians, we don't trust journalists, we've been let down and it takes time for that to rebuild and we're not yet in that place. Professional people have not yet realised how much trust has gone and so that's become a very individual thing where leaders have to earn that respect and trust from us as a society and technology has had a huge impact in the way that work operates. Now most of my working career has been spent in BT until a couple of years ago, British Telecom. So one of the largest corporates that you can imagine, obviously global, many, many divisions within that organization. When I first joined BT, your currency within the organization was your knowledge and your experience. And there was absolutely no incentive for you to share that with anybody else. It was your power. It certainly drove your pay rises. It probably drove your um, prospects for promotion. Um, and it was absolutely your status within the organisation, all of that knowledge that you'd accumulated and your experience of it. Now, the fact that most of you, I'm sure, have a device, I've been down there tweeting, I know we're tweeting over here, um, the, the handheld devices, Google, the internet, everything else, has put that knowledge, if not the experience, 
in the hands of everybody immediately. And while that doesn't devalue the knowledge itself, what it means is that in many organisations, the ability to actually then share that knowledge and experience with people is far more important now than it ever used to be. So it's changed that whole dynamic. Um, and I mean, five years ago, I'd have been stood in front of you saying, please make sure all your phones are turned off. Um, and these days, I'm really surprised if people aren't sharing the information, looking up references, making notes on whatever gadget it is that they have. So there's a huge impact there from technology already that we have seen in our lifetime. And the pace of that change is only going to speed up. I can't tell you how quickly, particularly in terms of things like communications, technology is going to change our lives yet again. And um, one of the other things that's changing rapidly is actually the nature of the work that we do. So again, 20, 30 years ago, far more command and control, far more production oriented. These days, far more service led, 75% of jobs are knowledge based or discretionary. That's from Daniel Pink. Um, so the, the actual nature of the work that we're doing is changing. And therefore, the way that we manage and we lead that work has to change because these things don't naturally evolve together. Um, customers themselves, again, us as people, we are changing. We are far more demanding now because we know things are possible. Uh, again, if I give you a BT example, 20 years ago when I joined in customer service, so 150 on the end of a phone, if you're moving house or sales or billing or whatever else, you rang me. Um, <laughs> depending on what mood I was, it would depend what response you got. Um, but at that point, we were quoting people six weeks for installation of a brand new telephone line. And by the time I left 150, about seven years later, we were actually quoting three working days in the vast majority of cases. And that's an impact of both the technology improving and customers simply stating that it was unacceptable to take that long to install a new phone line. Um, so we are more demanding. When our founder of Engage for Success, David McLeod, does this talk, he has an anecdote from his time as the brand manager for Dulux. And he talks about the yellow paint card. Now, we all know what Dulux paint cards are like full of all sorts of different shades. Well, apparently, the yellow paint card was one yellow when David started. And it was one yellow because yellow pigment was incredibly expensive, it was really difficult to synthesize, and you were damn well lucky to have one yellow at all, so you just put up with it. These days, a yellow paint card is exactly the same as any other, again, driven by technological change and customer demand. We expect to be heard. If you think about it again, all of those things out there like TripAdvisor, like Amazon, our feedback is solicited and we expect to give it. We expect our voice to be heard and recognised as people out there. And we start to expect that in work as well. And the generation coming up underneath us, even more so, their way of using technology and that instant feedback is absolutely resident to them, it's native to them, it's how they are and it's how they live. And they will bring that into the workplace and it will be no good for us to sit there and go, well, you just can't do that, leave your phone at home. That is not going to work as a tactic. So, engagement is actually around how we manage this paradigm shift that we're currently in. And we are in it, the, you know, the work is changing around us as we speak. Um, and if we can get it right, if organisations get it right, they will actually thrive. It's not just about survival. They will thrive as social organisations. Their productivity will improve. And as engaged people within a workforce, all the research suggests that we are actually happier and healthier if we are engaged. So it's good for us as well. It's good for the economies and the societies in which we live and in which we work. That technology side again. How many of you have heard of Glassdoor? I, well, I get a few more hands every time I ask that question. So Glassdoor is like the trip advisor of workplaces, if you've not come across it. So you can go on, you can have a look at your workplace. If anybody's already written something about your workplace, it will be there. If not, you can make an entry about how it is to work in your place of work and also what your boss is like, your CEO or whatever at the top of the organisation. And um, in the same way as... as Organisations like Amazon do, they have a reasonable um, way of keeping a track to make sure that people aren't entering malicious or disgruntled reviews of particular organisations. So you get a reasonably balanced view about what it's actually like to work in that organisation. And this technological change puts transparency at the heart of the organisation. And when we're talking about um, talent and succession, for instance, as Linda was talking about earlier, being the thing that keeps her awake at night, this puts engagement and how you attract and retain 
uh, never mind talent, people to work for you, right at, at the start of the process, far earlier than we ever think it will be. So this isn't about keeping people happy that work for you. This is about how you get people who don't work for you yet to think, oh, that's a nice company. I really fancy working for them. I'm reading what their staff say. And you know what? They say the boss is really good. And they've got an idea about what's going on. And they've got purpose about what they do. And actually, it sounds like an organization that I could be interested in. So it fundamentally changes where we think about engagement happening within an organization. We've also now got five generations in the workplace. Um, it's the first time we've had that sort of gap between the start and the end of the workforce since we used to stick Victorian children up chimneys. Um, this lovely lot here, this is part of my extended family. And um, this lovely lad hiding behind the hair in the middle is my 17-year-old aunt. And aunt is currently in the middle of A-levels. Um, he could actually already be in the workforce. He could have taken an apprenticeship at 16. He's looking at an engineering apprenticeship this year, fingers crossed. And, um, you know, I, that's scary to me as a mother. My God, my child is in the workforce already. No. Um, this lovely grey-haired chap at the back, this is my stepfather, John. John is 73 this summer. John is a plasterer and has been all his life since he left school at 14. John is still working. Um, and John is still working for two reasons. One, because he's the age he is, he has got sod all pension. Um, and in order to keep playing golf and everything else, he has to plaster people's bathrooms every now and then and keep his hand in so that he can do the things that he wants to do. But also, he keeps working because work is an integral part of who he is. He's a master craftsman, and that's how he considers himself. And his work is a massive part of his identity because he's been doing that for almost 60 years now. Um, and that is a huge part of who he is. And we should never forget this, that work is such an integral part of our lives. It's not a separate thing. It's life. I, I really hate the phrase work-life balance. It's all just life. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we need to remember that. But, I mean, the point about this is that, obviously, Ant at 17 and John at 73 are hugely different people. And how do we cater within a workforce that has to cope with that massive amount of life experience that is different, of gender, of attitude, of all of these things that are different between those generations? And we are going to have to, because work as we see it in the next five to ten years, we are, we're not going to have a retirement age. 67, whatever it is, that's all going to go. We are just going to work as long as we want to work for. We're not going to be made to work, but we will be able to work. We are living longer and we are living healthier. We are going to want to be productive, active members of society, however that looks like, probably well into our 70s by the time we get there, potentially even our 80s, who knows, with healthcare changes and everything else. So it's worth us thinking now about how fundamentally these changes will impact how we operate work, but also how we operate all of those different pillars of society that actually back up work. So like taxes, how will taxes work and pensions when we're all working till 70 or 80? These will have to change. Education is already, to some degree, not working. Um, and that's because, I mean, in five to 10 years' time, people will be doing jobs that do not exist now. We don't know what they are. So how can we teach them skills when we don't know what skills they're going to need? The skills that we need to teach them are how to learn, how to change, how to be flexible, how to be resilient, how to adapt. Our education system is not set up to do that. So we are failing children already because they are going to the workplace not equipped to deal with what they are going to have to deal with in five to ten years' time. I mean, this is um, very briefly just an allusion to the stuff that uh, obviously Hillary was talking to us about. We know so much more now about how the brain works, and that should start to impact our places of work now. We've got Kahneman, we've got David Rock, we've got Daniel Pink. These are really important people to go and read and understand about. Um, Daniel Pink particularly was a huge personal eye-opener for me when I was reading um, Drive, around motivation and understanding actually what motivates us as people. Because I'd always struggled in a big corporate because give me a target and an objective. And do you know what? I, I just tend to go, I, I don't want your target or objective. And it's because I'm a rebel, as I now realize. It's taken me a long time to get there, but I realize I'm now a rebel. And we can tell that from the number of people come up to me and go, you don't look like your picture on LinkedIn because you had pink hair. And you don't look like your picture on Twitter because you had turquoise hair. <laughs> 
Um, but, you know, it's taken me a while to understand that I am absolutely demotivated by things like performance management. Um, I really, really am, as are many of us. And we now understand that much better. And it has to start changing the way we look at HR policies and practices like appraisals, like performance management, like mediation, for instance, and how we manage conflict within the workplace as well. These things are going to have to change. So the nature of engagement itself. Um, this is just a quick picture of me and a couple of members of my team. Um, and Engage for Success is a voluntary movement. So I'm the only employee. Um, these two lovely ladies, one is a volunteer, one is a secondee. We look like this all the time. This is what engagement looks like. We work really hard. We are a tiny team. We are predominantly volunteers. We have very little resources. We are really high performing. And it's because we love what we do. And we genuinely do look like this. It's a bit scary. Um, this is what engagement is not. This is a real picture from Swindon Council of an employee who was so disengaged that he could not be asked to get out of his cab and move that log. And that cost them money. It cost them money, obviously, to repaint the road. But what it really cost them was brand damage and reputation when that went viral, which, as you can imagine, it really did. But that's, that's disengagement. That's what it's like. We've probably all been there. Um, when you've got a rotten boss, when you don't like your job, it makes you ill, it makes you do things like that. It's not good. It's not good for us as people, and it's not good for the organisations that we work for. This is also not good. This is a shot from Metropolis, because I'm a science fiction geek. It's the first science fiction film. And these people, are, you know, they're just regimented. They, arguably, they are productive. You could say that they were productive. There's no creativity. There's no innovation. They're just doing what they're told, and they're just about barely hanging on. There's no individual thought or anything like that. That's not engagement. And nor is this. This is command and control. This is ruling by fear. These guys are manifestly all pulling in the same direction. They haven't got a choice about that. Sooner or later, you're going to burn them out or they're going to rebel, one of the two. So this is not engagement either, however much the results might look like it. Again, you know, these guys are going places, but it's not sustainable. So my organisation was developed from uh, a government report that was done 2008-2009, um, very commonly known as the McLeod Review. And they were, David McLeod and Nita Clark, our founders, were asked by the government to go and investigate, is engagement actually a thing? Is it a tangible thing that we can recognise? And if it is, is there any evidence out there that it actually works? And their conclusion to that, after surveying about a million people and a huge amount of big and small organisations, was that absolutely yes, it is a thing. And I think anybody who's felt disengaged would immediately agree with that. Engagement's something you feel, you know. You don't say, I'm engaged. You say, God, I love my job. You know, but we've been there. We, we understand what it feels like to enjoy what we do on a daily basis. So, yes, it's a real thing. Yes, it's beneficial. The research all demonstrates it. And they found four characteristics, four enablers, that exist in highly engaged, highly performing organisations. And the very first one, in fact, touches on that storytelling piece. It's about the story of your organisation. Um, so we call it strategic narrative, but that's what it is. It's the story. And that's not the boss giving you a video once a year with what the strategy for the organisation is that you never listen to again, or the piece of paper and the glossy leaflet that you bung in a drawer and you never look at. It's the living, breathing story of your organisation, where it's come from, where you are now, where it's going to, and what your part in that story is. And this touches on purpose as well, so your understanding of how you fit. And again, a, a BT example, for a lot of the time that I was there, we used it's good to talk, both internally and externally. Now, it didn't matter where I was in the organisation. I think at that point I was in capacity planning somewhere in the depth of IT. But it's good to talk means something to me. I emotionally connect to that. And as an employee, I understand that what I'm doing is enabling that for all of our customers. When we changed the strategy to let's roll out super fast broadband, strangely enough, I can see that as a commercial direction, but I don't connect to that emotionally as an employee at all. So getting that right and having leaders who have the ability to bring you into that story and make you part of it and, and help you find that purpose is absolutely key in any engaging culture. You then need managers who actually know how to manage. And do not underestimate our ability as a nation to not recognise this point. So we put people in positions of management responsibility and we fail to give them any form of management training whatsoever. And this is really, really common. This is not unusual. And in fact, I, mean, I say here in this country, it's fairly common elsewhere as well. We still haven't grasped this fundamental fact 
that being able to manage is not natural to most people. They actually need to learn how to do it and need to learn that it is a good thing to do. Engaging managers tend to do three things well. They're able to focus their people, give them scope, and then let them get on with the job that they've given them to do. So they trust them to do it. They don't micromanage. They treat their people as individuals. This is hugely important. And um, for me as a rebel, it's massively important. I, I find it something that's right at the top of my priority list. But for all of us, we like to be clocked as an individual and we will respond much, much, much better if we have a manager who will do that. And managers are able to coach and stretch their people. And that's not just the acknowledgement of good behaviour, that's dealing with dysfunctional behaviour constructively and quickly and not allowing it to poison anything else within the organisation. We then have employee voice, and this can encompass our relationships with trade unions, something as simple as suggestion boxes, employee engagement surveys, all of this. But the fundamental point there is that people trust that their voice is welcome and will be heard, that they are actually being listened to. People in BP knew what was happening in that organisation, and BP weren't listening. People in Midstaff's hospital knew what was happening. Nobody was listening. It's your biggest defence against brand and reputational damage that you can possibly have is fostering an environment where your employees can speak up and will be heard and will be acknowledged. You don't have to do everything they say. We don't work in democracies generally, um, but you need to be listening and you need to acknowledge. And then the last one is around organisational integrity. Most organisations have values, whether they're explicit, whether they're implicit, whether you've got them on a card in your wallet, whatever it is. There'll be something that you identify as, this is how we are as an organisation. If the behaviour that you see around you doesn't match with that, you will not trust. There will be a big say-do gap. Managers will not be doing what they say they're going to do. And there will be mistrust within the organisation and engagement will not flourish. So what are we and what are we doing? We are the UK's movement for employee engagement. We're not a membership organisation. We're not a government project. We are led by industry and we are funded by industry through corporate donation currently. We run a website which I encourage you to go and look at, engageforsuccess.org. Everything on there is free of charge. Um, so there are case studies, there are big research papers, there are research papers that we do. We run thought and action groups that anybody can get involved in. We have uh, a London regional network that run events that you can go to. We do all sorts of stuff. So I encourage you to go and have a look at that and see what you can find out about engagement for yourself and how it applies within your organisation. And then one thing I should actually mention is we choose not to specifically define it. Um, we're very lucky as a movement. We don't need to. Um, if you're measuring engagement within your organisation, you need to have a definition of what engagement means for you. Because if you're going to measure it, you need to understand what it is that you're measuring. We can say, we are a broad church. We accept all of your definitions of engagement and we welcome them. So that's where to find us. And um, come and find us on Twitter. Uh, email us at info at engageforsuccess.org. And you will find loads and loads of papers, evidence, research, everything else around engagement on there. Um, this is me. You can find me on Twitter as well. I always warn people that I tweet engagement, Morris dancing, cake and trains, just in case you get a bit worried about the fact that I'm not talking about HR all the time, because <laughs> I really don't. Um, but if you can cope with the Morris dancing, then you'll be fine. So please do come and find me on Twitter and have a chat. And I want you to have a little think about, as I leave you now, um, what does your perfect day at work look like? Because self-awareness is a big part of this. How can we improve our own organisations and our own cultures if we're not actually thinking about what works for us at work? And this is my list. This is my personal perfect day at work. So I like a leader and colleagues that I can trust. I like to feel that I'm in a group of people that are working well together. I like a view of my organisation's journey that I actually believe in. I like the knowledge that I can have fun at work. We don't talk about fun at work often enough. I have great fun at work, and that's what makes my day go so quickly. And it's really important. It doesn't make me any less productive. It's not something to be scared of. It makes me more productive, if anything. Um, but I also know that when the chips are down, we're all able to pull together really quickly, really effectively, and we really make things happen. Knowing that other people have got my back, that I've got support. If I get something wrong, I've made a mistake and I learn. I'm not hauled over the coals for it. Again, really important for me. Opportunities for growth and development. This is one that isn't necessarily one for everybody. For me, it's hugely important. I'm an explorer. I'm curious. I like to have that. For other people, it's much lower down on the list. 
and knowing that my voice is heard and needed and valued. So that's what I need at a day of work. And that's, this is what that looks like for me. I did warn you, science fiction geek. So this is this, the bridge of the Star Trek Enterprise. And that might actually look like a command and control environment. But in fact, and I mean, at this point, John looks about to issue an order. In some senses, it is. But by the time he gets to issuing that order, he has all of their views. He knows what they think. They've been able to say what they need to say. And they trust him to give that order, and they will respond in that sense, because he has earned that respect from them. They also have one of the greatest strategic narratives ever. I mean, to boldly go, the, the, you know, it's just wonderful. Um, but that, you know, I've thought about it. I know what my good day at work looks like. And if that's not happening for me, then I try and do things to make that happen. And you know, that might just be as simple as saying, have I woken up in a bad mood this morning and am I being naggy and putting off everybody around me? It can be as simple as that. It can be as simple as leaving your office door open or saying to your boss, can you leave your office door open? <laughs> or when you come out to make a cup of tea, say hello to some people and don't just stalk off and stalk back. Or say thank you to people usually at the top of my list. It's really an easy thing to do. It's amazing how little we do it. So just some thoughts there to leave you with about how the world of work is changing and actually how fundamentally as people we don't change because we will still need those things that are in the four enablers. We need purpose. We need our voices to be heard. We need to be feeling effective and valued. Um, and so even as the world changes around us, we actually will remain needing those things. So there we go. Thank you very much. <laughs>